Welcome to the Under 21 Convention in Orlando, Florida. Guys, the 21 Convention is about being the ideal man, and part of that is learning how to defend yourself, protect your family, protect your loved ones, and in a way that's effective and that's going to work. You know, when we read about misinformation or we learn misinformation about that, or we try and posture up and learn that sort of masculinity in the wrong way, a lot of tragedies can happen, a lot of big, life-changing mistakes can happen. This man is an amazing guy. He's given speeches before on self-defense at the 21 Convention, but more importantly, he has trained some of the world's elite at how to be better with attacks, protecting yourself, and so on. Let's bring on Stephen Grosh. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, I will ask some of the guys I was chit-chatting with earlier, I mentioned it to like one or two already, don't give away the ghost if I ask some questions or, or have something like hidden, don't, uh, don't ruin it, but I'll get to you guys later. Um, I've done some pretty awesome teaching and training in my life. Um, just real quick bio for the guys who aren't familiar with me. Back in uh, 99, I started working at a gun range and I wanted to become a cop. That was like my dream was to get into law enforcement. And I uh, started working there thinking it was going to help me out by learning how to shoot guns and stuff. Actually, it didn't because they all think I'm like a crazy gun guy or something. Um, I got really good at it. I got so good that within a couple of years I was teaching and then I became the director of training at this big indoor range in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And I wrote and taught all the classes there. And then I ended up training with some really bad dudes and learning more and more stuff. Everything cool? And uh, ended up being able to train with some really awesome guys and then got so good at it, a couple of those guys asked me to come out and help teach with them. And uh, that was just life change. I mean, I've trained SWAT teams, military, law enforcement. Um, I was just in the back demoing with Steve where we're showing stuff like how to kill people with like a tie or, or if your hands are restrained or anything. So like FBI SWAT, DEA SWAT, all these kind of guys. Um, I then got married when I was 23 years old and in less than a year of marriage, we, uh, she had a miscarriage and then she asked for, uh, basically didn't ask, told me she wanted a divorce. And so that was just like a game changer. Um, during this point, I had had this opportunity to move out to California and some SWAT guys that we had trained, they were like, dude, you're so good getting along with these other guys. I still have the email saved afterwards. He emailed me trying to follow up and he's like, get on the police department, I'll help you. And within a year, I'll get you on the SWAT team. And I was like, that's my dream. And uh, my ex-wife was like, I don't wanna move that far away from my family and stuff. And I was like, all right, I'll put your needs first. And then a couple months later, I got hearing damage and that whole dream's over. So less than a year of marriage, divorced, hearing damage, what the fuck am I gonna do with my life? So I, so I started focusing on self-help and self-improvement. Um, read a book called The Game. How many of you guys read that book? I'm surprised some of the guys I was talking to at lunch haven't. Even though it's kind of out there stuff, it's still like required reading to me. So if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you do. I read it, it had a big impact on me. Um, ended up reading the book, started applying all the stuff that I read in less than a year. I met the guy who wrote it, Neil Strauss. He offered me a job, moved out to California, and I became a, a pickup coach. And went from junior coach to senior coach to being the uh, executive coach, where there's still vi YouTube videos of me, like in hidden camera, in field, all that stuff. I was the go-to guy for that. I was in charge of the other coaches and everything. And things were pretty awesome for a while. And then uh, I don't wanna get too much into it. I'll, say, I'll tell this off camera, but ended up going solo about six and a half years later, bravopua.com. Um, and this is my full-time job. I teach guys how to be cool, confident, social. I do one-on-ones, boot camps, all that. And I'm a firearms and edge weapon instructor. And so I recently moved up to Flagstaff, Arizona, and I teach uh, edge weapons, knife fighting, like one to two times a week, and I have students and stuff too, and that's basically my job. So it's a pretty awesome life. This is what I do. When I was picking up the little tagline for my website, I really focused on it hard, and I was like, pick up dating and life. And like Nick was saying earlier, I don't know if he's in here, but I went up afterwards, was like, man, that was a great point when he was talking about the, the pickup stuff, is so many of the guys in pickup try to teach you how to pretend to be a cool, confident guy, but most of these guys actually never become cool, confident guy themselves, or they can't teach you how to become that. So that's a big part of that incongruency. So I was like, I'm not just teaching pickup, I'm teaching dating and life. So to me, these are all life man skills that everyone should have, but real quick, trigger warning, there's gonna be some stuff here you might not like, um, I'm happy to debate you guys as much as you want afterwards. Every seminar, there's some people here with different beliefs. That's totally fine. Um, but we're not going to do it while we're on stage recording live and stuff like that. But afterwards, like I'm here the next two days hanging out, I'll answer, debate, talk about as much stuff as you want. So 
this is a big motto in my life. This was life changing when I thought of this. If you cannot protect yourself or your loved ones, you are not a man. And I like quoting myself in my own talks. So. Um, but I actually, I put that up, but I didn't have Bravo. And then guys were like, that's really good. Who came up with that? And I was like, I did. Um, but that's really, like, to me, that's my mindset. If I can't protect myself, my loved ones, which maybe you guys only have a few loved ones in your life right now. Maybe later you have a whole bunch. Maybe you have kids. If you guys aren't able to do that, you failed them as a man. So that's my mindset. Another thing I want to mention, which um, this is from NLP, but I've used this in gun classes like, since like 2000, 2001. But I use this little model in every one of my classes. Um, and I went through my slides so you make sure you guys could see them and back on this one also because um, it's harder to see some of it. But this one is just, if you, if you Google the four stages of competency, you'll see this on Wikipedia. So I like this little graph because only recently did I see them add this next part of it. But for you guys who don't know the four levels of learning or the four stages of competence, it's unconscious incompetence. And does anyone know what that means? Exactly. You don't know shit, and you don't even know you don't know shit. So the analogy for that is, let's say, uh, driving a car. So if you're a, a baby in the back seat, you know nothing about driving a car, and you don't even realize you don't know nothing because it's just out of your reality. Okay? Conscious incompetence. Since you raised your hand, what's that one? You know that you suck. Exactly. You know you don't know shit. So that's like when you're a kid, and you're like, I, I want to drive a car. Like maybe you sit on dad's lap for the first time. And uh, you're looking at all these knobs and switches and dials, and you can't reach the gas pedal and the mirrors, and it's confusing. So you know you don't know shit. Then the third phase is conscious competence, which means? Let's say if you're shooting a basketball, if you focus on your form actively, you can get a good shot going. So it's an analogy. The definition, let's say, is with conscious thought, you can perform the correct action. Okay? And the conscious mind can handle, they say, five variables, plus or minus two. Okay? What does that mean? That means when shit hits the fan, you're not going to rise to the occasion and magically become the punisher or something. You're going to just default to your lowest level of training. But I, I teach this in pickup because guys who go out, they're like, I need to work on body language. I need to work on hand gestures. I need to work on my eye contact. I need to work on my vocal projection, my vocal tonality. I mean, there's so many things right there, that's so many variables that your conscious mind's going to get overwhelmed just with that. And I've got to talk to a girl, and I've got to approach her, and I've got to pay attention to what she's saying. So right there, just from NLP, that becomes overwhelming. So this is why you just have to small chunk things. So I would go out and for like literally one week just focus on eye contact. Doesn't matter what I said or anything, it was just that. So if we're taking it into the martial arts world or firearms training, um, if, if like let's say we went and did a firearms lesson, the first thing when we're shooting a gun, like my, our first one to two lessons I'm going to work with you, is side alignment and trigger control, which is just basically two variables. Because five plus or minus two, that means three on your worst day, okay? So right there, that's it. Conscious competence with no distraction, nothing else. I can do something correctly if I consciously focus on it. The fourth level, which is where we want to get to, is unconscious competence, which means what? Oh, you're good and you don't have to think about it. Exactly. Subconscious or unconscious mind, you can just do it. So Steve, I think, just popped out. But how many guys here have done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu before? Okay, so any of you guys who just raised your hand, even if you've only trained for like a month or two, but how long have you trained for? One year. Okay, a year, things are ingrained in muscle memory now. If some guy came up behind you and just tried to sneak a rear naked choke on you, what's your first reaction going to be? Yep, and tuck the chin. Yeah. Boom, you're just pulling it in with no thought. If you're at a bar and some guy starts doing that, instantly you're defending it. Well, how did you get to that level? A year of training. How many times a week? Five. Five times a week? Yeah. Good. I used to go like two or three, that's good. Um, what I like, though, with this hierarchy of competence is that, I, and I only recently saw this when I was, I was doing phone coaching with one of my guys, and I told him to Google it so he could look at the triangle, and they added these four. I hadn't seen them before. But if you're unconsciously incompetent, that means you have the wrong intuition. So I remember, how old are you? Okay, so when I started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu back in 98, 99, which I don't know how old, how old you were back then, but first UFCs, it just came out. I started doing it. I did a couple cage fights, two and one, but it was style versus style. But I remember telling some guys that I knew about jujitsu and about choking people out and stuff. And one of the guys was like, oh, that wouldn't work on me. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, because I have the will not to tap out. And I was like, like we all know how stupid that is now. Like, guys are laughing. But back in the day, people still believed that. When the first UFCs came out, people didn't buy that stuff. And that's because he had the wrong intuition. So guys who've never shot a gun before, it's, it's 
the people who like to be the most vocal and argue with me about this stuff are the people with the least amount of training or experience. So the guys who've never shot a gun before or even held one love to argue to death about their beliefs on firearms and laws and legalities. So just right now, just FYI, if I don't, like I said, I don't want to get into those debates on camera, but I'm happy to later. I'm happy to crush you later on those. But wrong intuition, it's because it's going through the wrong filter. So if someone's saying that to you like about jujitsu, like two guys behind you laughed when we said that. But do people, are there people who still believe that? That's what you say, or tap or snap. But do people still believe that a chokehold wouldn't work on them, like kung fu guys and stuff? And you're like, yeah, all the time. You're like, oh, here we go again. So um, then you get to conscious incompetence, which is the wrong analysis. So then if you watch those old Gracie in action videos, the guy would get tapped out, and he'd get up. He's like, OK, well, let's do it again, because it's going to be different this time. So even though he knows he doesn't know how to stop the choke, he's doing the wrong analysis. Same thing with pickup. Well, I went out and talked to this girl, but this didn't work out. Well, that's because of this. And you, your mind isn't at a level yet where you can understand it, so you, you have the incorrect analysis. Then you start getting better, like when you start rolling for a year or five times a week. Someone gets you in something, maybe it hits you. Like, I had trained for a while. I stopped when I moved out to LA. I started training again, started going to 10th Planet. And um, like the Darce choke wasn't out when I first did jiu-jitsu. Now it's very common. So I got Darce like five times in a row. And I was just like, all right, what's going on here? What am I doing wrong? Because it wasn't like this back in the day. So I had the correct analysis, and I figured out how to counter it. And then eventually, right intuition, um, guys who are martial arts masters, I could come up and show them some little variation of a move they've never seen, but they're going to react positively and do something correct because their intuition is at such a high level. Same thing when you talk to a, like a dating coach or a PUA coach, where you're like, well, what would you do in this situation? And I've never been in that exact situation before, but chances are my solution is going to be better than your guys' solution because I've trained and done this stuff for years and I have more experience to draw on. Common, makes common sense, right? Perfect black and white common sense. Okay. So this is the phase you go through for everything when you're learning. So once you understand the process, you can do it more effectively. So like I said, I just go through this with everything in life. It goes through that phase. Um, how many of you guys have heard about the sheep, wolves, and sheepdog analogy? Raise your hands. And at the end of this too, like this talk, I'm not going to get, I got a handful of slides I'm going to talk, but I really want to have a lot of Q&A at the end of this for you guys. Because last seminar, when I talked about gun stuff, one of the guys um, asked, he goes, well, but I want to carry a gun or a knife. What if I just carry it around like a little syringe in my pocket I could fill up with like red food dye? And if someone like, tries to fight me, I could tell them it has AIDS blood in it and spray them. <laughs> and I was like, that's a horrible idea. It's like, you're going to carry a syringe around with it? That's like the, well, if we go back to the old one, that was the, the incorrect intuition and the wrong analysis. Um, but I was like, no, it's a bad idea. I wouldn't do that. So I'm used to teaching at different levels, but some of you guys, if you're under 21, maybe you've never even shot a gun, maybe from whatever country you're from too, they ban guns. So, so that, I'm gonna have a lot of Q&A at the end, so you guys have any questions, write them down, because I wanna get to everyone's stuff here too. But back to sheeps, wolves, and sheepdogs. Um, how many of you guys have uh, seen the movie American Sniper? Okay, at the beginning, the flashback scene where he's sitting at the table, like they start talking about that. that well, that all comes from the book On Combat by uh, Colonel Grossman, who's an Army Ranger, and he was also the psychology professor at West Point. So, smart dude and a badass, pretty awesome. Um, I'd highly recommend reading that book, because when you start trying to think about crime and bad things, and you're trying to look at it through your own filter and your own perspective, that's, not, that's the incorrect filter. So this really helps you. It's like required reading to all my cop buddies and stuff like that. They're like, this is the book. You have to buy it. But it comes from there. And it says there's three types of people in the world. There's sheep, which are everyday citizens. Let's say 80% of them, uh, of the human population's sheep. These are just everyday people. They just like going around there with their life. And they don't like to think about bad things or anything like that. 10% of the population's wolves. Those are the bad guys. They're the ones who eat the sheep. They're the ones who come and, and, and look for victims. So they're the criminals. They're the murderers. They're all that. Sheepdog. Sheepdogs are the protectors. They protect the flock. Like one sheepdog can keep the whole flock safe. But sheep, they don't really like sheepdogs because they kind of they look like a wolf, don't they? Like a wolf, dog, sheepdog, fangs, they kind of move, look the same way. Um, when, when wolves aren't around for a long time, the sheep actually start resenting the sheepdog. And they're like, you know what? We'd rather just you put on a sheep coat and just pretend to be like this. Like, it, it just reminds them that there's wolves out there. You're paranoid. Like, why do you have to think about that kind of stuff? So 
That's how they think until a wolf comes. Then guess what? They all cower behind the sheepdog. So after 9-11, and this is, they talk about this in, on combat, you can actually Google um, sheepdog Bravo PUA, and it pulls up a, a link on my forum where it has the whole passage from the book. And if you just read that, that's good, but I'd recommend reading the whole thing. Um, but it talks about how after like the Columbine shooting, like the kids that like jumped on the cops or were holding on to them, they had to pry them off afterwards because these are the ones that are going to keep people, uh, keep people safe. So when you start getting into that mindset, and you're like, all right, there's wolves out there. Am I going to be a sheep or a sheepdog? Now the problem is, like I have no problem if people are sheep. That's fine. But for some reason, sheep have a problem with people being sheepdog. So that's where the issue comes. So I'm not telling you guys to be sheepdogs, but you should at least, like I said earlier, learn how to protect yourself and your loved ones. And we'll get more into that. Um, how many of you guys have ever, ever heard of the OODA loop or the OODA cycle? One, two. How'd you hear of it? Military? Uh, with uh, Master Chim, right? Yeah. Um, he, he does the same knife fighting stuff that I'm uh, a training group leader. Yeah. Master Chim's a cool dude. Um, but yeah, OODA loop. So first O, I'm not going to get too much into this stuff. They actually do whole briefings. Um, Colonel John Boyd used to do whole military briefings on this, like day-long briefings just on this. Colonel John Boyd, they used to call him 40-second Boyd. Um, within, he would let someone in a fighter jet get behind him. Within 40 seconds, he could reverse it, and he never lost. And they figured out, he goes, I was going through the OODA loop, the OODA cycle. He's also the guy who came up with the mathematical equation to figure out why the MiGs were better than our F-14s. And the F-14's the top gun plane with the, the movable wings, if you remember that scene in Top Gun where it's moving around. Well, the reason is, is they try to make this one plane do multiple things, and it sucked at all of them. Instead of, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Gordon Ramsay, where he's Kitchen Nightmares, he's going in there trying to help people uh, remake the restaurants. He goes, just do one thing well. Because they go in there and they try to have like three or five different menus, and they do everything shitty. He's like, just do one thing well. So Colonel John Boyd's like, let's just make a plane that does one thing well. And that then was the F-15, the F-16, which then turned into the F-18. Now they try to fuck it all up against the F-32, which is just a, a shit show. And if you guys are familiar with the A-10 Warthog, you guys are in airplanes? Yeah, like his main guy is the guy who came up with that too. So they actually, like, like I said, he came up with a mathematical formula to show like speed, like the velocity, how it's able to turn everything. And he's like, that's why the MiG's better than our F-14. So this guy's super smart. Um, anyone too who's in the Army, especially Marines, really learn this stuff. It's called the OODA loop. So I learned it from all the tactical training, but then as soon as I got into pickup, all this stuff instantly uh, came over into that. So just real quick, OODA, first one's O, observation. So I'm observing, gathering information. Second one, orient. I'm, I'm zeroing in on dreadlocks in the front seat row because that caught my eye because that's different than everything else, so I just orient on that. Um, D is the decision-making factor. So I decided to ask him a question when he raised his hand, and then action was me asking him the question, how long you train jiu-jitsu for? How many times a week? So this is just a thought process loop that all of us go through. Again, once you understand the process, you can be better at it. Um, once you start really getting things into the unconscious competence phase, then you can kind of skip those. All of a sudden, some guy puts a choke on you. I don't have to orient, uh, decide, and act. I just go right into action because now I'm, I'm skipping ahead. So read that. That's the stuff that helped me look as I'm approaching a three set at a bar. I can instantly notice that, well, it's a four top table, so four chairs, three girls are sitting there. In front of the girls, I see one empty glass and one half full glass, or half empty glass, I guess, if you're a pessimist. But right in front of each one, I can see those glasses, and I know one of the chairs is empty. So as I'm approaching them, taking my one to two steps in, I'm already formulating a game plan on how I'm going to open them. Now, I don't think like this anymore, but when I was first starting out, like, is the seat taken, is it not? I don't know. Well, actually, if you observe, all the information's there if you need to get it. So just being able to, there's a good quote, lots of people uh, look, but they never see. So once you see things, you can start being aware of bad things that can happen. So we're going to get to specific examples in a second, but OODA loop, you see a guy walking into the bar looking real sketchy. Well, what happened here a week ago? Right there. If your OODA loop's dialed in, Maybe something else uh, could have stopped that. Another problem, and this is the big mindset with um, sheep, is someone else will take care of it. So bad things happen, right? Obviously, a week ago here, horrible things happen. But my mindset isn't someone else will take care of it. My mindset is 
I will take care of it. One of my favorite quotes, hope is not a strategy. I don't know if you guys have been there before. I've had to count on hope when I was younger, when bad things happened, didn't help me. I first heard this quote um, when I was reading it from uh, Tony Robbins years ago. Or actually, maybe it was on a, one of his little YouTube videos where he's interviewing someone. And the girl's asking a question, and she talked about how she's a victim of blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no, there are no victims, only volunteers. And I've researched that later. It's, it's accredited to someone else years before. Um, but even that, when I went to the quote database, was trying to look it up, people, other people, are, 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 they say said it. So I don't know exactly where it came from. But if you apply that to the tactical world, there are no victims, only volunteers. Well, if that's my mindset, that's the paradigm I live in, then if something bad happens to me, I volunteered for that. Now, I know a lot of people, like I said at the beginning, trigger warning might not like that, but if you have that mindset, it changes everything and it makes you start thinking about what you can do to avoid becoming a volunteer. So I wanna ask you guys this question. Um, just, I'll call, I'll say it out loud on the microphone so the guys who are watching this later can see it. But just real quick, what do you think the scariest moment of your life ever so far was? Um, I got held up at gunpoint when I was 18. That's pretty fucking scary. Yeah. Okay. What did you do afterwards? Uh, well, he exited my car eventually after. I'll say it. So he just said that he, he was mugged at gunpoint when you were 18 years old? Okay, we don't need the microphone, I'm just gonna, this is gonna be quick. But mug 18, and then afterwards did you decide, decide to go, hey, I need to change things and figure things out to where that um, maybe doesn't happen again? I mean, it's somewhat of a long story, but. Um, yes or no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, so you did. Um, what do you think the scariest moment of your life has been so far? Twelve-year-old in another country, and a guy who's like twenty-five comes up and starts some shit with you. So scary stuff, especially when you're a child. So everyone has different scary moments in their life. I've talked to people before and asked them this question, and I've had people say flat out, "When I first had to learn how to drive a car, first time I got on the freeway, does that was that a scary fucking moment when some of you guys had to get on the freeway for the first time?" So, so for some people, that's the scariest moment. You fucking aced it. I was hoping I shouldn't have picked that bad. No, I'm joking. But when I first got uh, got a motorcycle. Man, I got that a couple years ago. Got on the freeway for the first time. I got a Harley Iron, souped it up, did a 1200, did a chip. It was pretty awesome. And broke in the 50 miles where I could finally go over 50 miles an hour the first time. And um, I ended up uh, getting on the freeway. It was late at night. I was like, oh, no one's around. I'll be able to finally cruise. I'll go 65. Got in the carpool lane. And within seconds, cars were all surrounding me. And I was like, shit, I better get over. And I turned my head. No one told me that when I turned my head, the wind's going to blow my helmet back. So I fucking freaked out. And I was like, that's it, man. I'm, and this is only a couple years ago. I was like, I'm never riding on the fucking freeway again. Fuck, that's the scariest thing ever. Because if you mess up once, you wipe out, you're run over, you're dead. So after that, I was like, I'm never riding on the freeway again. Well, a week later, two weeks later, I'm going like 90 on the freeway, like it's nothing. So some guys will say like the first day of school, college, high school. I remember I went to a small private Catholic school for a while. First day in high school, I literally was sick to my stomach. I didn't want to go. I was so nervous. Um, first date, we're asking out a hot chick. Family member missing, has anyone ever had to deal with that? Even if they're just missing for the day or for the night and they don't call? I mean, that's fucking scary shit. Scariest moment for me ever, at home with my, she wasn't my ex-wife yet, it was the fiance, and um, we're watching TV late at night, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 someone starts pounding on our apartment door. And I literally see the door moving like at the bottom, so someone's just kicking it, trying to get it in. And um, I look and I'm like, shit, where's my gun? Because I used to, I was a manager at the time and I got rid of my full size gun and I just had a little revolver on my ankle when I was at work. And I'd always come home, take it off and put it on the coffee table and then when I'd go to bed, I'd bring it next to the bed and put it next to me. And I turn to the coffee table, it's not there. And I'm like, shit, and the door's just going boom, boom, any second it's gonna come in. So I go run in the bedroom, look for it, can't find it. Come back out, the door's still getting kicked in. And I was like, babe, get in the room, call 911. And I uh, went back in there with her and I saw it sitting on the coffee table, or the, the, my end table next to my bed. 
And I missed it when I first went in there, even though it was in this, its second spot. And I went and got it, ran over the door, pointed at through the door, because I was like, it's fucking go time. And this probably, the whole thing was maybe 20 seconds long. Seems like it was a lot longer. And then I go, who is it? And the kicking stopped. And I, I looked through the people earlier, and they were covering it up. So I see them like slowly move their thumb down, and it's like two drunk high school girls. And they go, it's like, Vicky here? And I'm like, wrong fucking house. And I was like, I fucking, it was the scariest thing ever in my life. Because in that moment, I'm like, dude, if it's like two or three big guys, like I can handle myself pretty decent now, but even still, a couple guys, that's, that's hard. A um, couple guys coming in armed. Like to me, the biggest fear ever was like me being in there, somehow getting beaten down or something. And my fiance at the time, my future wife, I think she was pregnant at the time too, is in the house. And I was like, man, I, I was a volunteer right there. I didn't handle my shit. I didn't have like extra security precautions, maybe a dog, maybe another weapon, having a sp sp uh, specific protocols where I put my weapon. That night I got lazy and I just put it in there because I didn't want to have to carry it into the other room. So right in that moment, like I said, that was the scariest moment ever in my life. And I was like, I'll never go through that again. How can I level up? Well, first thing you gotta understand also is even if we would have called 911, the police have no duty to protect. Now you guys might see that on the side of the car. It says protect and serve. That's a sticker, it means nothing. So are you really gonna call this chick to come help you? You know, I don't know if you guys can see it. She's eating a turkey leg. So real quick, I'm not gonna go through all this, but we teach these in our firearms classes, CCW classes. Jessica Gonzalez versus USA, um, June 1999. Jessica Gonzalez's three daughters, ages seven, nine, and 10, were abducted by her estranged husband and killed after the Colorado police refused to enforce a restraining order. She called the police repeatedly, telling them her fears for her daughter's safety. They failed to respond. Hours later, the husband drove his pickup truck to the uh, police department and opened fire. He was shot dead by the police. The slain bodies of the three girls were discovered in the back of his pickup truck. So this went all the way to the Supreme Court. She filed a lawsuit back in 2005. The Supreme Court ruled that she had no constitutional right to police enforcement of her restraining order. And that's from the ACLU. So that's a super liberal group right there, non-bias. That's reality. Second one, I'm just gonna summarize it. Uh, 75, lady, um, some guys break in the house and her and her daughter upstairs. And she, they hear the other uh, lady downstairs. She's getting assaulted. It gets quiet. Um, they call 911. The cops, yeah, it talks about who they were. They enter Douglas's second floor room where Kent forced Douglas, which is the girl, to sodomize him. And Moore's then raped her. I'm like, that's some fucked up shit. He broke in and made her, forced her to rape his ass. Um, anyways, they called and they were waiting on the, on the second floor uh, balcony. They waited on the adjoining roof and they watched as a police car slowly drove by. Another officer knocked on the front door, but of course, no one's gonna answer. So they called a second time and they miscategorized the, the call as investigate trouble. Was, no officer was ever dispatched. After the screaming stopped thinking the police were there, they called down and alerted the guys who broke in, Kent and his friend, to the presence. For the next 14 hours, they were raped, robbed, and beaten and forced to commit sexual acts upon one another. The court held that the police are not liable for failure to provide adequate police protection. So again, like I say, this isn't me making things up. I'm not paranoid. That's real life. That's Supreme Court cases. 911 will save us. That's what I told her. The average response time for an emergency call is 10 minutes. Atlanta's response time is 11 to 12. Nashville comes in at nine minutes. That's from Police Beat. Google it. You'll see it yourself. How many of you guys watched that funny uh, YouTube video, the, the reporter Charlie LaDuff, where he um, calls the lady has a, a home invasion, they call 911, and he's like a reporter for Detroit, and uh, they wait four hours for the police to show up. And he takes a bath in her house, he clears the house, makes sure it's safe, he takes a bath in the house, goes to McDonald's twice, he goes once, goes a second time, because uh, they messed up the order, comes back, four hours later the police showed up. So, and obviously we all know how unsafe and crazy Detroit is right now, right? Which also has some of the strictest gun laws. So. If you, if you look at the data, places that make it harder for law-abiding citizens to get guns are the most unsafe. Um, this one goes into the home invasion, which was the scariest thing for me. Uh, oh no, uh, that's the next slide. This one, uh, this just happened like a month ago. There was the whole family that was murdered. It was all in the news. The sheriff even said later, he advised the members of the Roden family, there was I think eight of them that were killed, members of the targeted family, they could be in danger. And the sheriff was like, you guys have to be armed because you find out very quickly, A, 
911, if you can call it, how long are they going to take to get there? And they can't get in trouble for not doing their job. So he's like, if you guys want to be safe, it's got to go into your hands. And I had that happen to me at a Shooter's World where a lady came in, bought a gun. She's like, yeah, my um, brother-in-law was abusing my sister. We took her in. He got arrested. She goes, I'm anti-gun. I used to donate to anti-gun groups. She goes, and then um, I was getting on an airplane, and I think it was the U.S. Marshals, hopped on the plane, pulled her off. No, MCSO, uh, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Hopped on the plane, pulled her off, and they go, yeah, you got to get somewhere safe right now. There's a hit out on you. The guy is in jail, put out their information, the name. He was like, I will pay you guys to kill the sis his wife, the sister, and the, the husband, the brother-in-law. So she's like, well, what are you guys going to do to protect me? And they're like, well, I mean, we could we'd let you know about it, but she's like, well, are you guys going to stay at my house? I'm like, no, most cops. How many of you guys watch The Wire? One of the greatest shows ever? Yeah. So very quickly, think, imagine them going, are you guys going to keep me safe? They're like, we're, we're two hours behind on calls right now. So no, they're not. So they go, what, what should I do? She goes, they go either hire security or get a gun. So she came in. She's like, a day ago, if you would have told me I'd be in a gun shop buying a gun, wouldn't have believed you. She got real, she came in, bought a revolver, and I went out and gave her like a four hour nonstop lesson teaching her how to use it. Never heard from her again, but that, that's reality, checks in. And it's also interesting too that, that people, you get mugged and you decide, oh, I gotta change. Or people in the Hurricane Katrina or Sandy, like run out of food and water, the power goes off, and afterwards they're like, I wanna get a generator. Um, a, your car gets broken into or stolen, people get a car alarm or a club. But it's always retroactive after something bad happens. To me, because I don't want to be a volunteer, I'm proactive on all that stuff. So just another little tip. But this one was the one that was the most fucked up thing ever. If you guys you get on Wikipedia, you can read more about it. 2007, Dr. William Pett, Pettit. Um, he was the guy that was beaten and then tied up in the basement. And then the two guys that broke in the house um, made the wife go to the bank pull out all this money. She told the bank teller, hey, these guys are robbing us right now. They called the cops. Um, they went back to the house where the wife and the 11-year-old daughter were raped. And um, he heard this going on from up uh, down in the basement. He heard her being raped upstairs. And then um, he got free. And then they found out, so they, uh, there was another daughter, I think a 17-year-old in the house. They, the 17-year-old and 11-year-old were tied up in their beds, doused in gasoline, pillowcases over their head. And the wife, they had already strangled and killed and they set the house on fire and killed all of them. So literally that's, when I was talking about the home invasion story with me, that's the kind of shit I was thinking about that would happen. How many of us could live with, with going through something like that? I wouldn't have been able to. He, he did, he just recently got married, had another kid and stuff. There's no way I could make that. I mean, shit, I almost didn't survive my fucking divorce. So also right now too, like I said last week, um, the, the shooting here, 49 killed, 53 injured, 30 hostages. Police arrived within minutes. If you guys saw this on the news or Google it, the cops showed up within minutes and they were told to wait for SWAT, which generally SWAT can take up to an hour for them to get there. But once they got there, they waited three hours. Now there's reasons why they didn't enter. They thought there was bombs and stuff too. But I know a lot of conspiracy theorists, people are talking about how there was the shooting and um, they go, oh, there had to be more than one gunman or blah, blah, blah. Well, if the general rule is if you get to the hospital and you're still alive, they're gonna keep you alive. If you get to an ambulance, and you're still alive, hopefully they can keep you alive, you get to the hospital, you're probably gonna make it. But if you're shot and then laying on the ground bleeding for three hours, so that's common sense wise, why do you think the, the death toll was so high? And then obviously he went around shooting people who are still on the ground. Now you guys then heard stories about him calling on the phone, calling the news, calling the police department, calling his girlfriend, all that kind of stuff, right? So as he's distracted talking on his phone, what if one person in the bathroom was waiting? And, and had a weapon on him. So right there, that, that's my line of thought of how I think of it. But I'm not, I'm not ripping on sheep, but if you've never been in that, oh, actually, you know what? There was the one guy that uh, was on the news, and he was interviewed by um, Megan Kelly. He said he ran outside, and he held the door closed. Did any of you guys see that video clip? You didn't? And then she goes, uh, well, what happened? He's like, well, there was people pounding on the door and screaming and stuff. He's like, but I held the door closed because my friends are out there. He was trying to keep them safe. And then Megan was like, well, do you think any of those people made it out or did they die? I think it was Megan Kelly. But she's like, did you think they made it out or whatever? He goes, I don't know. And he starts crying. He's like, I, I don't know. I think I, I, you weren't there. It was, it was the worst thing. I think I, I thought I was doing the best thing I could. And so right there, he didn't rise to the occasion, but he defaulted to his lowest level of training. 
And when you're a kid and your brother's trying to start a fight with you or something, what do you do? You hold the door closed. So that was the most training he had. That's what kicked in. We don't know. We'll never know. But he might have locked the door on other people that were trying to get out. So it wasn't even the bad guy that necessarily killed them. It was someone else that was there. So again, like I talked about, um, being prepared. FEMA.gov. This isn't paranoid stuff. This is on FEMA's website. And they, they, they soften at the beginning. Even though it's unlikely that an emergency would cut you off for food supplies for two weeks, consider maintaining a supply that will last that long. Store at least one gallon per person per day of water. Consider storing at least a two-week supply for each member of your family. How many of you guys have that covered? How, you did? Any Mormons in here? I thought Mormons are supposed to have that all covered. Two weeks? So right there, I live in a Flagstaff. Actually, I think this is the next slide. Oh. Um, up in Flagstaff, there's specific things I have to worry about because that's a different environment than Phoenix, which is just two hours south. So Phoenix, it's 117, I think, there the other day. I mean, that, that's horrible. Hell, I hated living there. But up in Flagstaff, during wintertime, 36 inches of snow, I think we got. So two-hour drive, one of the snowy cities in America. Um, I actually had live Facebook this, was tweeting it as it happened, but my girlfriend was out of town, and I was home, and the power went out. So at home, I mean, it, was, it got down, I think, negative four that week, Fahrenheit, which is colder than negative four or Celsius. And um, it was fucking cold. So because I've prepared, because I've done survival training, because I've done winter tra training, winter survival training, with my buddy Tony Nestor up there, um, which we're actually doing a cool specialty class in a couple months up there for my guys. Uh, I knew what to do. I knew how to close down my house, how to close the doors and stuff so I didn't lose any heat. Um, I had prepped and got a space heater, a Mr. Heater from Walmart with like propane tanks, and I had extra propane tanks with me, and I had food and water. So the power went out. I was okay. I also had a sleeping bag, which is really good to, to low temperatures. So because I was ready, there was no issue at all. But there's a saying that 24 hours without water, total anarchy. The Flint water crisis that just recently happened, um, as soon as they started hearing about don't drink your water, everyone flipped out. Within an hour, every store is empty of water. So you're not going to be able to go there and buy it. And uh, then they had people buying 99 cent water milk jugs. I saw some guy in the back with it. You're supposed to drink a gallon a day. There were people out in this parking lot selling them for 10 bucks a piece. So you laughed, but if you have a wife and kids or you and you need water, what are you doing? What if you don't have any money? A few kids and stuff, and there's some idiot in the parking lot trying to rip you off, people might steal it too. So instantly, I mean, it's nice that we live in a nice, safe reality and world and all that. 24 hours without water. It's, it's dawn of the dead. I don't like saying uh, Walking Dead anymore because that, that show sucks now. But <laughs> I used to use zombies all the time during my, my analogies for the gun classes and all the zombie movies came out kind of ruined it. Um, now I use terrorists, but yeah, I'll think about all that stuff. If, if something like that really happened, I mean, how fucked would you be if it just happened right this second? I'd be okay, but you guys might be fucked. Anyways, one other little thing, and I always talk about this three ways to deal with resistance. I was talking about this at lunch, but really this is just kind of like a model to apply for everything. So the pickup analogy would be I go into a set, talking to a group of girls, and some girl goes, you're really cocky. And so now I want to force on force deal with that. How would I deal with that? I'd go, I'm not cocky, you're fat. So I, I get a couple laughs, which is funny, and I win, but now I'm a fucking dick to the whole group, and obviously all of them are going to think I'm an asshole, rightfully so. So if I want to redirect it, it would be twisting it to something, or turning it to a positive, which would be, well, actually, I'm not cocky, I'm confident there's a big difference. Which, what do you think the follow-up response to that is? Well, what's the difference, or what does that mean? I go, well, it's not cocky if it's true. I go, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really awesome, so I'm actually downplaying my confidence level right now. So now, why are you so awesome? And now I got phew, all this awesome stuff. Or preemptively, I can be aware that I come off as cocky and tone it down, so it just never comes up. So simple, simple way. Anytime you guys are running, I want to throw this in there as the PUA analogy so you guys have it too, but anytime I'm dealing with any situation, I call it resistance or friction, I run it through all three of those filters. So tactically, the analogy I use is Mike Tyson. I piss off Mike Tyson in a bar, he throws a punch at me, force on force. 
I block, he punches. What happens? He's still going to knock me out. Or I throw a punch at him and he blocks. What's going to happen? I'm going to hurt my hand because his force is stronger. So even if you might win, you still lose. But in that one, I'm losing on him no matter what. So I redirect it. This is like the Steven Seagal. If you guys watch those funny videos of Steven Seagal doing a keto to the Russians, the demos. It's so horrible and stuff too. And you see all the Sambo guys in back. Hey, you guys done grappling, Sambo's legit. Um, all the Sambo guys back there watching it and they're like, what the fuck are we watching? It's so horrible. But there is some good stuff in redirecting. And I do get on judo and stuff. That's all the throws and everything. So redirecting it would be like doing the Steven Seagal uses energy against them. But preemptive, I would either A, not piss off Mike Tyson enough, or B, be out of range to where he couldn't make physical contact with me. So talking about the survival stuff we're talking about, well, some guy's mugging you, force on force, what am I going to do? Am I going to go for my weapon? Am I going to try to take his gun? Well, redirect it. Maybe I try to, hey, there's cops behind you, or you try to distract him or something. Or preemptive, as I saw the guy getting close, or as I was aware of my surroundings or something, I didn't let it get to that point in the first place. So which one's the best one? Obviously, it's always. Same thing with pickup, same thing with getting in a fight with your family, same thing with like, dealing with a boss at work. Like, oh, I'm late on this deadline. What's the best way to deal with it? Don't be late on your deadline. Okay? Very simple. But when you understand this, and you, how does it apply to pickup fighting or survival? Well, one of the main lessons my buddy Tony teaches is a lot of guys go out to the woods, they're not ready for survival, um, especially starting a fire. But some guys might bring a fire starter with them. Maybe they'll bring a lighter. But if a lighter gets wet, it doesn't work. If you go high elevation, it quits working. Or if you just break it, it doesn't work. Or if your hands are cold, I did the hands in my sn the snow, you're supposed to do it for 60 seconds. I got to 40 seconds. My fucking hands were killing me. I can't light a lighter. So you need gross motor skills, so fire steel, a sparker. But he goes, if you're going to carry that, you should carry some tinder with you, like Vaseline soaked cotton balls or something else that will actually ignite, because carrying the fire starter is only 50% of it. But just carrying those two things could be the difference between life and death. So preemptively, having that in your survival kit, that could be the difference. Having a gun or a firearm with you, that could be the difference. Staying out of a bad neighborhood, that could be a difference. So some of you guys were already asking this, but unique to you. So one guy goes, hey, I don't know if you know about the laws in California. And I was like, I know some of them, but I'm in Arizona. I lived in California for years. One of the main reasons I moved back from California to Arizona is I don't want to live in a state that makes it illegal and hard for me to protect myself and my loved ones. So right there, that's a deal breaker. Um, I've had opportunities to travel and fly out to places for one-on-ones and all that. And if it gets really bad, I'll even tell the guys, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go there because I don't have my, my stuff with me. So victims and volunteers, I don't want to volunteer to put myself in a situation like that. So also where you live in your environment, that dictates your clothes, what you can and can't wear. If you notice how I'm dressed, I specifically dress like this today because this is like my flight staff outfit. Okay, so this is like REI, hiking, outdoor stuff. It's a cover shirt, it's comfortable, cool t-shirt. That's just my normal day-to-day -day chill clothes. My Solomon shoes that I love with my speed laces and stuff on them, if you guys know about it. They're super comfortable, easy to get on and off. Um, but I can go do a tactical class. This is what, like, basically what I teach in. But also the baseline of Flagstaff, this is like how people dress there. Or they totally look like you. Because it's all like backpackers and like hippies and kind of outdoor people too. You know, a guy like you walk with a big Osprey bag, you see like 100 of those a day. Girls. Different color hair, like multiple small back tattoos and stuff, all those like birds and stuff too. That's the baseline there. But let me ask you this. Um, how many of you guys know right now where the nearest hospital is? Raise your hand. Okay, where is it? That's not specific. What hospital is it? I don't think that's the one I looked up. Um, what level tra trauma center is it? Okay. Is that the closest one? You don't know. You just saw one, which is good, and you paid attention, you observed, so that helped. You can see how all this stuff applies to everything. But um, is it paranoid of me that whenever I travel, I get on Google and I'm basically on the plane and I look at the hotel and where I'm at and, hey, where's the closest ER to where I'm staying? And how many of you guys know about uh, the trauma levels at the hospitals in the ER? What's, what's the highest level, one, two, three, or four, or five? Go, answer. Why would four be? I would, I would assume one or five would probably be. Um, one is, level one. They can basically do everything. But if it's a 10-minute drive to a level one or a two-minute drive to a level two, but most people don't even know the difference what a trauma level, trauma center is, right? A lot of guys never even heard that. 
learn that stuff. Um, teaching pickup boot camps and seminars and all that shit, one of my guys at one of the seminar had an epileptic seizure. He didn't tell any of us about that beforehand. And I had just run out and my other coaches and stuff were around and someone else had to actually help out and he didn't tell anyone about his medical concerns. And all of a sudden some guy sees him on the ground shaking. If you guys have seen a seizure, an epileptic going to seizure, not pretty. And so this guy who's never dealt with anything like that kind of freaked out, but he totally stepped up. Since then, he's done all this first aid training and stuff. And he said some of the most valuable, most helpful things he ever learned in his life. So highly recommend all that. But right there, um, if you're out traveling, maybe not now, but 10 years from now with your family and kids, and all of a sudden something happens, I don't want to say about an alligator attack, but something happens in Florida and you've got to get them somewhere safe. Wouldn't it be nice if you had that bookmarked in your phone already and you could hit favorites, boom, and you already got GPS direction to get there? Is that paranoid? I mean, if any of you guys needed it right now, we could go outside, get a car, I could be navigator, I can get you guys to safety. So part of me being a man is being able to protect myself and my loved ones. I love you guys all at least that much right now, because you guys came here. <laughs> Steve, I love, well, I love Steve a lot more. Um, but what about where you live? The police departments that cover you, uh, like I was talking about two weeks worth of food, what about medications? How many of you guys take medicine? If you guys need it to function, do you have a supply? Because what happens if all of a sudden CVS runs out? I just had to deal with that a little bit ago. Uh, Sam's Club, they're like, oh yeah, we can't get it anymore. Had to go somewhere else and get it. Luckily, I, I, I was able to, but certain medicines people need to survive. Insulin, stuff like that. What if shit happens? What if there's a natural disaster? What if you lived in, in Louisiana or Jersey when there's the hurricanes and stuff? Boom, that's all it takes. Nothing crazy. It doesn't have to be a zombie apocalypse. It could just be a normal, natural disaster. Right now in California, crazy forest fires. People are being evacuated. Um, they're already saying in, in uh, I think Michigan now, but also Florida, the algae blooms are supposed to be coming up again. So instantly all the water's not gonna be drinkable. So this isn't, I'm not like some paranoid crazy guy who's like, this is like into the world doomsday shit. Oh, I just played the new Doom on PS4 too. That's pretty fucking awesome. But I'm not like, I like being like that guy, but I'm not some into the world guy thinking about that. This is just normal basic shit that's on the news all the time. So how many of you guys have a first aid kit at home? Good, how many have a, one in the car? I spend a lot of time in my car driving and stuff. And even if I don't need it, what about pulling over and helping someone else who might need it too? I've done that. So um, gas, keep a little gas. I have a snowblower, so I went and got a bigger uh, gas tank for, the, for that, but also some for my car in case I needed it for emergencies. Because we live up in the mountains, and just the other day there was a car accident on the freeway, five hour delay going down the 17, just to get in and out of town. So what if that happened and it was worse than that? What if the road, there was an earthquake in Northern Arizona, Page, like the road sheared and it was just shut down for months. So you had to, like hours long the other way to get around. So this isn't like crazy paranoid stuff. This is just, I mean, to me, common sense shit, but common sense isn't so common. So anyways, I already mentioned the heater story, guns and ammo. I mean, I, one of my buddies who's a, a Phoenix cop has been like in tons and tons of shootings. When Y2K was going down, he stocked up on, on guns and ammo. And one of the other cops was like, why man, why didn't you get any food and water or anything? And he goes, well, if my kids don't have food, and your kids do, am I gonna let that happen? He's like, I stocked up on guns and ammo because I can get what I need. <laughs> and the other cops are like, fuck, that's fucked up. But he's right. And the important thing is, even if you guys don't think like that, are other people gonna think like that? I mean, even though, like I said, Walking Dead sucks, um, are there other people that are the scavengers, the, 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 the people going out there and attacking and trying to yeah, it's just, that's the way it is. How many places around the world right the second the shit like that exist? This isn't just made up shit. We're just, we're in a cool place right now, but that's, uh, that's not reality. So real quick interactive part. And I think this is the last slide. There's one slide after this, and then we're gonna get to questions. Um, everyone close your eyes. And the camera, put your hand in front of it. No, I'm just joking. Um, but everyone close, close your eyes. And this is real, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm gonna stay up here. There's just a, little, a quick little um, drill that I ask everyone. So everyone in here, I want you to point for this. But for me, where's the closest emergency exit? Okay. For you, where's the closest emergency exit? Okay. What if that exit's t uh, taken? What's, what's your second option for you? And this is why I can't call on you guys. It's already too confusing and stuff. Okay. Put your hands down. Where's the closest fire extinguisher? Uh, eyes still closed, don't cheat. Where's the closest fire extinguisher? 
A lot less hands went up for that. Okay? Hands down. There's a bad guy coming in here. Where's the closest weapon? I like the gun show. Good job. Okay? Improvised weapons. A couple guys pointing at me. I appreciate that. I am the weapon because all the other things are tools. Correct? But, and that should be your mindset too, but an improvised weapon, camera strap right there on your, what is that, a 70D? 60. Could I choke out Steve with that if I need to with that camera strap? I was thinking blunt. Blunt impact. Yeah, there's glass in it. I could cut people with it. That works too. And last question with your eyes closed. Just the person who's sitting closest to you, uh, say it out loud. Uh, what color shirt are they wearing? Green. All right, open your eyes. Look at the shirts. Look at the emergency exits. Look at the fire extinguisher. So right now, when I came up here, eyes on me, closest uh, emergency exit for me is right here. There's one also right there. But if for some reason this one's compromised, is that one also probably compromised? Either outside or inside? Maybe. So what's on the other side of this wall? What's this wall made out of? This is, a, this is a movable wall. We could push this over in a second. So there's another fire escape on the other side over here I checked. If we went out through here, there's the main, uh, I think almost like a side entrance here. Pass that one to the next one, past the ATM. There's the pool. Could we get out that way if we needed to? So how many people in that nightclub, if they just needed to get out, that could have saved them? And that really was what saved most people. So and I've done this drill uh, when, we, when we go to the mall on the last day for a day game, and we're all sitting down at like the, the food court, we're eating, talking about stuff. Of all my guys close the, their eyes, and we've all been together for a couple days now. And I go, who's sitting on your left? Who's sitting on your right? And most guys can't even do that, let alone the color of the shirt. But I go, who's on your left? And they're like, mm, I don't know. Is it so-and-so? And they get that wrong. So these are just fun little drills I can do. Like As I go around, I look at this kind of stuff. And I'm like, if shit happens right now, where am I going? So this is a drill that I do, and the, people ask a lot of these questions later, how do you develop this? This is how. And I've even done it on my blog, where after we did an improvised weapon class, I told all my guys, I was like, all right, set an alarm on your phone or your watch or something, especially your phone, set an alarm for um, Wednesday at 2.15 PM. And when that alarm goes off, it's go time. Look around. What weapons do I have available? What weapons are on me? Shit's going down right this second. How do I defend myself? So you, this is a drill that we do where we're like, all right, right now, if I needed to fucking fuck some shit up, what do I have around me? Not much up here. I have cables and cords. One of the best weapons is the, the ground or the wall, impact. So I can grab someone down and throw them onto the ground. I mean, you've got tossed in jiu-jitsu and stuff, right? It hurts getting a, a good throw done on normal mats, let alone concrete or ground. So I'm looking around. I see some phones, pins. You guys might have like a nice little tactical pin or something. That could be a great weapon. I always fly with one of those. And um, I'll ask this now because this, all the lights and everything are starting to get warm. But EDC. So right now I'm wearing a, a cover shirt, which usually lets you hide more weapons and stuff on you, right? So even me taking that off, going off of the drill we just did, I'm going to give like a quick little side to side. How many weapons do I have on me? Five. Three. OK. What are they? My arms, I think they're not bad, but I think he's a little more. OK, knife in my pocket. This guy, I like this one. Actually, my buddy's the guy who designed this for 511. Um, the, the coarser knives, there's grip tape on the top, because it's actually faster to pull this out and deploy it with two hands, and we teach that. Um, I like this one because it's nice and small. It looks, doesn't look all tactical. I can open it with one hand easy. I can choke up on it. There's different grips I can get on it. I like this one. Is Anthony in here? OK, not yet. This is a gift to him. So that's why I had it in my pocket. Um, normally, I wouldn't carry that so you guys could see that. But right now, what else do I have on me? I heard five and six. This? There's a knife. There's a flashlight. Flashlight's one of the best weapons you can have. You can take this anywhere. I can fly on a plane with it. I'm looking at the clock. I can take it anywhere. It's basically like an X-Men superpower. Even in here, it's pretty bright, right? Since you're the one who saw it, tell me how bright it is. Pretty bright. So in a bar or a club, someone's on drugs, out at night in the street, someone's drunk, this is even more powerful. So it's literally like an X-Men superpower. I can blind someone, they can't see me, 
Now I can fight them with their eyes closed. That's a good advantage I'll take. And I use it with a knife or a firearm or anything too. It's just, it's, it's awesome. But a flashlight. Steve, you carry a flashlight now? Anthony carries one. I'll demo more stuff with it. I've taken out whole SWAT teams by myself doing force on force with sim guns or paintball guns. And if you know how to use a flashlight properly, they couldn't even shoot me. And I took out a whole SWAT team by myself, multiple times, doing low light hostage rescue training. So if you know how to use a flashlight tacti tactically and correctly, it's one of the best things. Anyways, what else? My left ankle? Nope. But I do have a Glock 19 right here, which is a full size gun. And as you guys missed that, even with the t-shirt, I also have my fixed blade on me, which is, this is a rat, headhunter blades, best knife ever. Um, the guy who designed it, I'm, I train under, uh, Guru Harley. Uh, you buy the trainer, the sheath, the blade with it. I have that with me. I can deploy it one-handed. I can draw with both hands. I can access it under stress and training. I do that stuff all the time. And I have my firearm on, on me. So I can go out and teach PUA boot camp. I mean, I'd be wearing my jeans, though, or something. But just my normal clothes, T-shirt and jeans. And I can have a, a full-size gun on me and a knife. So EDC, this is my primary. What about secondary? Stuff in my bag that I had with me. Extra mag, extra flashlight, a tourniquet. Because if something bad really happens, the tourniquet's going to be the thing to save your life. I'm riding my motorcycle. That's my little messenger bag that goes on me, chrome, little small one. Um, you just, I know a lot of guys even just carry one in the pocket. Guys that were in the military know this firsthand. The tourniquet's the thing that's going to save you. So um, even if I'm driving down the road, there's a car accident in front of me, I can pull it out. That'll be the thing that keeps someone alive. Well, if, if they are going to be able to live, that'll be the thing that keeps them alive. Okay. So little things to do, start learning, small chunk it. One topic a year, do tactical training, do firearms training for one year, do edge weapon training. I'm doing survival training, that was this one for this year. So I started doing wilderness, uh, desert, and um, winter survival. And we, we're getting to the point where we're doing that class that's coming up. Like I said, I know how to, I, you can see it on my Facebook page, I rubbed two sticks together and made fire. Like that's awesome. Pickup wise, awesome shit to talk about. Now talking to other guys who hear that, now they're into it. It's a DHV topic. Now I have all these classes and things lined up. Now I have more things to talk about that the future comes through. So what can you start doing right now? Just decide it. Um, basic things too, even if it's just like how to fucking change a tire, jump start a car. Most guys don't even know how to properly jump a car. I don't know how many of you guys played World of Warcraft, but maybe you fucking leveled up your character to level 60. Fuck that noise. I'm the fucking character. I'm level 60. Like, why would you want to invest all this time on an imaginary character, and then a new game comes out, and you gotta fucking start, like, like I said, I just beat Doom, it was pretty awesome, but like Red Dead Redemption, like these are cool games, but I, I could never get into one of those MMOs where you just spend all this time pretending to level up as a character. Like I'd rather myself level up. And like I said earlier, um, always try to look at it from a 180 perspective. I get into this with pickup with also, but if you try to look at things like as a criminal, like am I an easy victim? If you read these kind of reports, you can see it's always based like on body language and stuff. Were they in bad situations or unsafe? Were they in unfamiliar territory that made it easy for them to get picked on or assaulted or worse? So look at it from that other because if you're putting it out there, if, I'm, if I came up on stage and I was sloppy and my shirt wasn't fitting me right and I had a big belly and I just was sitting up here going, oh yeah, I've done martial arts and I've done cage fights and stuff, you'd instantly be thinking I was full of shit. You're like, there's no way. I'm like, yeah, I've done some. Um, the pictures are on my Facebook page. It's easy for you guys to verify all that stuff. But when I tell you guys this stuff, like, I, I convey confidence, and I know what I'm talking about so you guys believe it. So when I'm out walking around, this confidence comes through with everything. So you guys have heard fake it till you make it. That was a big thing with the PUA world, is they just teach you to fake it, and they never actually teach you how to make it or level up. So like, train, go take classes, go do all this stuff. This is awesome, fun stuff to do. I'm going to get to this how to deal with the popo, which is like my funny little thing. Maybe I'll do it for the, the video or when we guys are hanging out and stuff afterwards. But I actually have a whole routine I use when I get stopped by cops, because I've been stopped by them a few times, and I've gotten out of every single ticket ever. Even like driving in the carpool lane like an hour early. They, they'll cite other cops for doing that, and I got out of it. So using these kind of skills, you can, you can get away from that. That was something that Anthony and I were joking about. And if I had time, I wanted to do that, but I want to make sure we get time for questions. So. Really, that's the overall briefing, but specific questions. I'm already seeing some hands go up. Or are you just stretching? OK. Let's give a round to Steve first. I think, I think that might be the loudest applause so far today. 
Uh, my question is, uh, you know, I have a concealed weapons permit, but when you're in a situation like the Pulse nightclub where you're not allowed to carry, you said something about, oh, well, if someone in the bathroom was, like, how would you... Okay, so it, right there... What can you bring with you? One, Arizona, we can carry firearms into establishments that serve alcohol for consumption as long as you're not drinking, which everyone freaked out when that came out because they're like, oh, it's going to be crazy. People are going to be shooting each other at the... That came out like a year or two ago. How many shootings have been in the bars and the clubs since then? It's not true. So that's, that's real life compared to make-believe stuff doesn't happen. Um, I would never in a million years tell you not to follow the law where you live. And if we went out to a bar tonight, there's absolutely no way I'd have my firearm on me. Wink. I don't know, maybe. Um, <laughs> but sometimes when I go out to places, I've been to places where they pat down. But I still have a knife on me, even if I have my flashlight. Or I could take off where I could get Steve's shirt from his backpack or take my shirt off. And if the guy's distracted or you're talking to him, could I come up behind him and choke the shit out of him? In a second. So improvised weapons, uh, hard weapons that you have, like dedicated or tools, and um, also like optional ones that you have. I mean, also too, even if you guys just know how to throw down, there's a couple guys there that were good jujitsu guys, they would have been probably been able to stop them. So, but like I said, I'm, I'm basically packing all the time. I'd rather deal with legality, something small later than not be prepared. So, but like I said, I would never in a million years tell anyone here ever to break the law because that would be morally wrong. So, uh, if what about like you said, certain levels of self defense? If I wanted to study uh, art or certain techniques of defense, what would they be? And do you have any references for like yeah. picking that kind of stuff up? Yes. Wilderness training. Uh, wilderness training, there, there's only a handful of guys there, Tony Nestor, Arizona. Like, I'm not here to sell anything at all. I take that back. I did bring a couple knives, but I get the hookup on them. So if you guys wanted to buy them, I got them, like, at my cost for you. I like four. Um, but if you guys wanted to see that stuff later, I just guys always come up to me afterwards and like, oh, I want one. Um, so I would sell that, but I don't make a penny on them. But the survival training class we have coming up, that was sold out. I went public with it. Ten out of 12 spots were already sold. Two spots were taken, and we already have a waiting list. So... Tony has classes. Um, if you Facebook me, you guys can all Facebook me, any of this kind of stuff later too. Stephen Grush, facebook.com slash bravo PUA. Tony's awesome. Um, we, we do training and stuff together. He's one of the best instructors in this stuff I've ever seen. Uh, Kevin Estella is another guy I know that um, I've done some training with. He's more on the East Coast. If you guys Facebook me that, I can link you to that. Um, Jocko, who's a Navy SEAL, recently did a podcast with Tim Ferriss. Did you guys listen to that? If you guys heard his answer for the martial arts training, what'd he say? First thing to do is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Number one, I know tons of guys who did tons of martial arts, completely worthless, never works in real life. Uh, against a guy who did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for like three to six months, he'd kick that guy's ass. So I'd say Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu first. After that, maybe do some striking, kickboxing, boxing. This is what he said. And then after that, maybe do like Krav Maga or Kali, that kind of stuff. Um, I did Jiu-Jitsu for a bit back in the day. I wrestled also, so I already kind of, I feel pretty confident there. Um, Sayat Kali is the most amazing, awesome stuff I've ever done ever in my life. Sayak, S-A-Y-O-C. Kali. That's why I'm here in town also for this week after because it's a yearly um, training session, Sama Sama, the family gathering. And then I'm a training group leader in Flagstaff, Arizona for that. That's the stuff I'm, I'm not, I'm not an instructor in that, but I'm a training group, so we train it and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with the knife. I mean, I've been t paid to treat some bad dudes with it. I'm nothing compared to these guys. And even if you guys aren't able to train or find, well, we've talked about Sayak the other day. Even if you guys aren't able to do it too, they're, they're the only training videos I've ever come across that were really cool. Sayak three of nine which is a third of nine set for knife fighting, knife cutting. Uh, super awesome video, and then transition drill one, because they have all these transition drills they teach. And it might seem really complicated when you guys watch it, but if you go to seminars, like one of the guys on my, uh, one of my coaches, Farmer, him and I just went out to Texas and took it. Gareth Jones is another coach. He came out to Texas and took the seminar. So they do seminars around. Um, you were saying Guru Nixon, your neck of the woods, like that's the most awesome stuff I've ever seen. And mindset stuff too, top, top level. I'm, I'm glad to be a student again and learn from those guys because it's whew, awesome. So I was wondering, especially with Nick's talk about being present, how do you balance conscious competence with being present to the moment? Well, conscious competence, once things are in the conscious mind, you can only handle five variables, plus or minus two. So as you practice and learn this stuff, it goes from conscious mind to unconscious or subconscious mind. So me looking at these things, fire extinguishers, doors, I don't even, it's just done. As I'm scanning, there was one time I was out with a girl at a bar. Hot little, if you go to my website, there's a little box on the side. Put in your email address, get the free 30-minute interview. 
hot little Asian chick that I picked up. It's a whole story about that. But her and I were at the bar once, and it's this girl. She's like the smoking hot little like cheerleader, hot little chick. We're at the bar, one of our first dates, and we're sitting at a table, and I see all the bouncers go running in. And they're like big guys, like bigger, like your size, bigger than you. They go running in there, and I was like, wow, what's going on? So I was looking, we're sitting at this table right next to the double doors, and there's a small front door. So she's in the middle of telling me a story. I go, just a second, let's go over there. And she's like, well, let me, I go, no, no, walk over here. So we walk over, two seconds later, all the bouncers come flying out, hit the table we were at, bowls over. I mean, it was an ASU defensive lineman, I think they were carrying out, like five bouncers on them. So think about a big football player with five bouncers, how many fucking pounds of meat that is. And I'm not a big guy, so they probably would have fucking broke my back as they were going across. So she sees this, and she's like, what the, how did you know that's going to happen? And I was like, well, if I was a bouncer here and I needed to drag a guy out, this is the door I'd be taking, and we were at the fucking table right in front of it. So consciously, it's hard to think like that, but subconsciously, unconsciously, it's the same thing driving a car. Like, you guys get off the freeway, and you don't know how to, there's a, a roadblock. You get off an exit you've never been on before, drive down one mile, get back on. To you, it's a no-brainer. Try explaining that to a 10-year-old kid. He's like, well, how did you know which way to, how did you know that street was going to go that way? And we're like, well, I've driven enough that that's the way it goes. So once it gets to the unconscious, then you don't have to worry about that. Now I can consciously focus about other things, like speaking on stage. On the topic of home defense, uh, what would you suggest is the most effective and efficient firearm to keep? And uh, would that change necessarily if you had children in the house who could get to it? AR-15. So AR-15, assault weapon, it's the most horrible thing in the world. Well, why would, you, why would anyone need more than 10 rounds? Again, it's people who haven't done firearms training. They don't know the facts. Um, less than 20% of shots fired hit their target. So, and I think statistically, the average number for a home invasion, which is different than a robbery, home invasion, your home. They don't care if you're home, and they're going to deal with you if you're home. So um, average number of, of males, adult males, that break in is three. And average number of shots fired that hit their targets, 1.8. You can't hit someone 0.8 times. So statistically, if I get, want to hit all three of those guys one time, how many rounds do I need in my mag? 30. Why would anyone need a 30-round mag? Math, that's why. Also, um, an AR-15 round actually overpenetrates less than my Glock 9 millimeter. But unless you do the research, you don't know that stuff. So that's why all the SWAT teams and everyone have moved to those. So AR-15, but most importantly is then you got to get the training on how to use it. Same thing with martial arts, same thing with knives. I know more knife guys who've done zero training, and they think all of a sudden some guy's going to come at them and they're going to be able to pull out their knife and use it. It doesn't work that way. You don't rise to the occasion. Is it on our questions? That's, that's all the time we have. You can hit Steven up outside, and you'll probably get a more personal answer as that is. But we're out of time for the speech. Let's give him one final round of applause, guys.